Welcome back to this course on English language and literature. As you are aware, we come to you with a series of uh, lectures, in fact, four modules comprising 40 lectures uh, in total uh, on, uh, on English language and literature. And uh, you have already seen the scope of all, uh, you know, the scope of this course. And we are in module 2 of um, this uh, course. And as you are well aware, module 2 is uh, devoted to an exploration of the history of English language. And um, these courses are being brought to you by NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. Um, which um, uh, and, the, and uh, the courses are uh, by faculty from mainly from the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, let me remind you once again that the target audience of this uh, course uh, comprises students in now do a quick recap of Old English which was our topic of discussion in the last lecture. Well, you uh, would remember that whenever we talk about the history of the English language, okay, we need to refer to three uh, marauding tribes okay, from Europe, the Jutes, the Saxons and the Angles. And um, the Jutes are supposed to have come to England from Jutland, Saxons from Holstein and Angles from Schleswig. In fact, here you sign in this, in this uh, uh, just a moment please. Well, you will find uh, here that uh, the word English uh, had other you know variations from for instance, you can see that it comes from uh, the word Angles from the tribe of the angles and <coughs> we have these names for instance England was uh, initially called England okay, and English had this particular spelling. right? So, the old, old English uh, replaces is as we saw in the last lecture replaces the largely Celtic language okay, uh, and that was there in Britain and we also know that uh, you know uh, uh, after the the settle you know once the the Jews the, the Angles and the Saxons settled in Britain, um, the Celtic language uh, moved really to to uh, to places in Cornwall, in uh, Wales, okay, and parts of Scotland, right? So Old English is the English that um, came about after the use of the language that came along with the Jews, Saxons and the Angles and we call this period is also known as the Anglo-Saxon period. Then we found that some of the characteristics of Old English are as follows that definitely the pronunciation of Old English words differs a hugely if you may use a word from that of their modern equivalents. You only need to go to Google images, you know, you can uh, uh, look for the, the old English script and you can look at some of uh, the manuscripts okay, from Google images uh, and for copyright reasons I have not brought them here, uh, those here, but you can have a look at uh, you know, uh, some of the recordings, okay, the readings of from the old um, uh, old English scripts that are there on YouTube, for instance, and you can then have an idea of how different the pronunciation is, how how different uh, the the vocabulary, you know, the words are uh, from uh, you know uh, the kind of English that we use today. Okay, then there's also a difference in grammar. Of course, old English is called synthetic, while modern English is an in analytical language, and this is what well, an analytic language. Sorry, this is what we are going to look at in the our lecture on modern English later on. 
For grammar also, there was a distinction of number, singular and plural and case, and grammatical gender was not dependent upon considerations of sex. For example, Mona Moon is masculine, Sun is feminine, make then girl, whiff and child are a neuter, while whiff man woman is masculine because the second element of the compound is masculine. So, you can you we saw in the last lecture how these you know how old English differs tremendously from modern English. Um, there was also the twofold declension if you remember of the adjective where strong declension is used with nouns when not accompanied by def definite article and weak dis uh, uh, declension used when the noun is preceded by an article. Okay. Next, we also <coughs> looked briefly at uh, old English literature and following A. C. Baugh, okay, who says, uh, who said that the literature of the Anglo-Saxons is fortunately one of the richest and most significant of any preserved among the early Teutons. Okay. One of the um, most well known texts is of course, Beowulf, which is a folk epic and um, many of you have at least heard of the name Beowulf, uh, the, uh, the, po the Dior poem and uh, the seafarer. Okay. So, these are some of the examples, we are not uh, going into the literature part. Okay, of Old English, this, uh, this um, um, module being devoted only to language. Okay. In um, when we talk about literature, uh, most uh, in our module on literature and, and, and the various age, ages of literature, you know, um, for instance, the age of Chaucer, uh, beginning with I think the age of Chaucer, um, we would have occasion to look uh, through Professor Krishna Bora uh, more into detail. Okay. Uh, where she also begins by talking about uh, Beowulf, right. So, uh, then also, so we found that there were war poems and the uh, and tragedies like the wanderer and translations under the famous king uh, Alfred in that period. So, well, let us now uh, talk about uh, Middle English and let me again say that whatever uh, we discuss here in this uh, lecture is by no means uh, or is by no means going to cover everything that may be said about Middle English. I uh, will be just pointing uh, to some important characteristics of Middle English and some important political events that led to the rise of Middle English and we point ending with uh, we talking about the importance of uh, writers like Geoffrey Chaucer for instance. Okay, so, this really is uh, let me warn you um, rather elementary in uh, you know in um, in content, uh, but this is just an introduction okay to a phase of uh, you know in the history of the, the English language, namely Middle English, right? So uh, I uh, as with the previous lecture, A. C. Baugh's book, The History of uh, A History of the English Language, features. Uh, prominently in uh, you know as a source text for um, my lecture. Uh, so, does Charles Barber's The English Language, a historical introduction published by Cambridge University Press and uh, Indrani Ghosh's edited volume, History of English Language, a critical companion. Okay. Now, in talking about the Middle English period. Okay. Uh, this is one of the, the I would say the rare times really when we can you know pinpoint a certain date. Okay. Uh, we can look at a certain date as far as the beginning uh, okay, or how an event can really change the trajectory of a nation, can change the trajectory of the, the development of the language of a nation. Okay. Middle, uh, well, middle English is generally here, you know, it is really not, it is not really, um, you know, one long homogeneous period. Uh, you have early middle English, uh, you have late middle English, but this being, this lecture being an elementary one, what I have done is uh, simply refer to middle English as one of the important uh, periods of um, um, uh, the English language and the history of the English language and I have gone by the usually accepted dates of 1150 to 1500. It is a long period of time if you notice 1150 to 1500. 
Okay. So, um, well, um, Okay. Um, I had said just a while ago that um, one can at times when one is speaking about the history of a nation or the history of uh, the development of a language, um, though rarely one can point to specific, uh, a specific date or a specific event that uh, holds tremendous uh, influence or is really the core starting point when we begin to talk about a certain period, right? And in that, there are many scholars who, in fact, say that if you are to point to the single most uh, important, okay, event um, in, in this discourse, then that would be 1066. Okay, let's look at this here, please. 1066 is uh, the date when. William, okay, who was the Duke of Normandy, right? The Duke of Normandy. Normandy is a place in, uh, you know, it's a part of modern France, and William uh, was uh, then the Duke of Normandy. In fact, uh, the people in that part of France preferred to call themselves the Normans. Okay? The uh, historians say that they basically they were part of an earlier Scandinavian, sorry, Scandinavian uh, intrusion, if I may use the word, okay, intrusion uh, into France. Right? And people in that area chose to call themselves the Normans. Right? So, in 1066, Right, there was uh, uh, an, the important event known as the Battle Battle of Hastings. Okay, when William, the Duke of Normandy, um, became King William the First of England. Okay, so this was this is known as the Norman Conquest of England, and this is. Uh, extremely important to us because it brings in, uh, in uh, you know in a, in a very um, in a very important way the French element into not only the language but also uh, into various aspects of uh, even the culture uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Britain. It was a time uh, when French okay, uh, language and culture held tremendous uh, you know political power in the lives of the people. And most of this lecture here today would be, uh, would take off from this important event that is 1066, the Battle of Hastings and the conquest by, uh, you know, King uh, William uh, who went on to became, become King Will, uh, William, uh, the erstwhile Duke of Normandy. So, we are now, and you know, that is why we call this a separate phase, a very important separate phase called the Middle English phase of um, uh, the one reason why we divide um, uh, Middle English into two phases, Middle English into early Middle English okay, and late middle English is um, because of this event, okay, the beginning uh, sorry the battle of Hastings and the uh, you know subsequent very uh, very you could say um, a very rapid okay, growth of prestige of the French language and for late middle English is really um, something else, it was the growth of nationalist feeling etcetera, which we will talk about later and ending with Geoffrey Chaucer and uh, you know uh, the rise of 
uh, uh, an earlier national language. Okay. So, um, in the early period however, okay, uh, it so happened that once the French began to have political power, okay, what happens is French becomes the language of the royal court, okay, language of the royal court, right. Now, once it becomes the language of the royal court, it is quickly uh, you know taken up by the three uh, most uh, most important and you know um, apart from uh, the royalty the important sections for instance uh, this would be the time when there would be a sort of the first beginnings of class as far as language was concerned many scholars are of the opinion that uh, old english uh, didn't have at least as compared to middle english uh, the division of language on ba language based on class i mean there was a marked okay uh, a very discernible uh, division of um, you know the people of the populace of britain based on class for instance we would uh, you know it's it's quite logical for us to um, it, uh, you know to to imagine that the business class Okay. The business class would want to learn the French language. Why? Because French was as we know the language of the royal courts and because of the need to be connected okay, to uh, uh, you know to the royal courts to for instance uh, to people in uh, you know to the ministers to the royalty to people in power it was important for the business class to learn french okay uh, so basically you have the ruling class and the business class uh, you know speaking french and what happens to english english is then spoken by a class which begins to be recognized as a lower class okay so you have the upper classes speaking uh, uh, you know uh, the powerful classes and the rich classes speaking french and english being spoken by the lower classes okay this is again let's remember this is more far more pronounced uh, with the beginning of the middle age, uh, sorry the uh, of middle english than it was before if at all it was there before The next important uh, point that is related to this division of classes or, you know on the basis of language uh, is another phenomenon okay the phenomenon phenomenon of now you have to realize that, that there are two there are two languages side by side one was uh, you know the old english okay old english that was extant Okay, during the time of um, uh, you know uh, when uh, uh, William of Normandy uh, finally became uh, King William uh, of Britain, and the old English, uh, old English was used by, as we know, the so-called common people. Okay, the common populace, right? And also, also the nobility. Okay, and the people in power. Now, what happens is, we know that in Middle English, French becomes the language of power and pelf, right? Obviously, old English is uh, or English is not replaced by French altogether. So, we would have the phenomenon of people using two languages okay and of uh, you know two languages running side by side though in different class or different stratifications of class okay so this was an important phenomenon which is a of course we found is a replacement of the existing language by a foreign language that is french okay and b the simultaneous use if not by the same person 
however the simultaneous use of two languages and really you know the middle uh, the middle english period could also uh, you know could be viewed in two ways you can view it uh, as the you know the acculturation of french and english and you could also view it as a constant contest okay with sometimes you know in the early period at least the french language being dominant and towards the end of the middle english period uh, you know the attempts at uh, kind of reviving English or having English as one's national language. Okay, so you had the juxtaposition of two languages during this time. Okay, so fine. The Middle English dialects. Some uh, many scholars say there are five dialects, and some scholars say there are four dialects. But at least the important dialects were the Northern dialect. Sorry. Okay, the Northern dialect, the East Midland dialect, the West Midland dialect, and the Southern dialects. Okay, you remember that the Northumbrian, Mercian, etc., were the dialects that were uh, the chief dialects in the time uh, of Old English. Okay, so here in Middle English, the dialects are Northern, East Mid uh, uh, Midland. A West Midland and uh, and the Southern dialects. So let's uh, read then from Barber, from Charles Barber, whose te uh, text is one of our source texts here. He says, Barber says, Old English did not disappear overnight. Okay, this is a point which I had mentioned just a while ago. Old English did not disappear overnight at the Norman Conquest, nor did it immediately stop being written. Okay, obviously, you know it's common sense to think that you know a language will not disappear just because power has been taken over by somebody else. So old English did not disappear overnight at the Norman Conquest, nor did it immediately stop being written. For the West Saxon literary tradition was continued for a long time in some of the great monasteries. Right. So uh, the you know the, the West Saxon dialect of old English was alive. And it was, um, you know, maintained, sustained by uh, the great monasteries, even though, uh, you know, elsewhere, uh, as far as business was concerned, as far as power was concerned, the court was concerned, the language may have been French. Okay, so we are not to think in a, in uh, you know, in an erroneous way that with the coming in of uh, the Duke of Normandy as King William and. Uh, you know, along with him, so many are from the French no, uh, nobility. It doesn't mean that old English disappeared. It is for, uh, you know, it is for uh, simply for convenience. In, to to which is one of you know the hazards of really uh, dividing, um, uh, you know, time uh, according you know historical time into different periods. So these are some of the hazards that we have to bear in mind. Okay. Therefore, old English did not disappear overnight at the Norman conquest, nor did it immediately stop being written, nor the way, uh, for the West Saxon literary tradition was continued for a time in some of the great monasteries. But in the years following the conquest, changes which had already begun to show themselves uh, and in the less, in less than a century, we can say this is important in less than a century it didn't even take 100 years uh, for the old english period to be declared over and the for the middle english period to have considered to have begun okay so further um, also scholars call this a period of great change okay uh, for instance, there were more extensive and fundamental changes because of the Norman conquest and the conditions that followed more about this in a while. Continuation of tendencies that had begun to manifest themselves in the earlier period in Old English and changes affected that affected the grammar and the vocabulary of the English language. This being most important at least for our lecture here okay? and I am going to uh, spend some time speaking about the changes particularly in vocabulary with the coming in of uh, you know the French language you know for about um, close to close to 200 years okay but close to 200 years we see this uh, uh, we see that uh, you know uh, the language of the people the language of the common people so to speak remained English 
Okay. <coughs> Though there uh, were attempts, okay, at uh, you know at a certain fusion, right? Uh, English at that time was not exactly a language that was despised by the French. Okay, uh, there were, were elements of some sort of acculturation, as I said, between French and English. And for instance, uh, uh, the merchant class, okay, merchants would speak both English, okay, and French, right? And this continued for, uh, you know, continued for quite some time till uh, the conscious development of nationalist feelings, which again happened because of political reasons, and which I am going to talk about, uh, talk about in a while. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, we are going to talk about, and let's look at this page here. We are going to talk about the influence of vocabulary. Okay, the coming, uh, and it's very interesting to notice the patterns. For instance, uh, if you uh, no, if I asked you, if you, if, if you knew that French was the language of the court, okay, French was the language being learnt by the business class, then which, what kind of words are going to be borrowed? Okay, there was we know a lot of borrowing from the French language. So, what kind of words are going to be borrowed uh, and made part uh, of the, the English language? Uh, many of uh, those words remain with us today. So, now in this list let us look at the words that are going to come in with uh, you know what we call the French impact on the vocabulary. Okay. Now, for instance, the church, right? The church being the third, you know, uh, third uh, component of power. For instance, you have said we had we talked about uh, political power. Okay, we talked about uh, business power. We talk, and the third is the church. And it, apparently, the number, the largest number of words, okay, that came in during this period were, were from the church. And um, for instance, ecclesiastical words, right? like religion, okay, prayer, uh, words of vocation like pastor, okay, then chaplain, right. These are some of the words that uh, as you see has become uh, part part of uh, modern uh, the modern English vocabulary it has, has stayed with us and also in the church for instance uh, things that are associated right for here for instance you have words that have come in based on vocation okay uh, or you could say um, uh, based on status regarding to vocation in the church. And we also, uh, or say uh, general words like prayer, uh, we also have words that are associated, let us see here, words that are associated with the service, church service. Okay. The words that are associated, that are, uh, that have, were borrowed from French and associated with church service are for instance, incense. incense, lectern, lectern. Now, it is from this religious, you know, religious background that today we use the word lectern also in academia. For instance, when a person gives a lecture, right, uh, from a podium, we also refer to it as a lectern. Then, um, abbey, Okay, convent. Okay, these are some of the words that are to do with service. Okay, with church service. Then uh, the important next important 
domain is in the domain of law right obviously now with the coming of uh, uh, the normans with uh, uh, the duke of normandy you would have a number of words that are borrowed from the french language into the legal uh, you know into legalese or you know the language that we use in uh, the legal system and now let's look at some of the words here and these are crime arrest depose innocent decree decree felon from which we have felony okay proof complaint fine all these words you will realize are important words even in legal you know the legal language used even in our country okay so these are uh, uh, words that were borrowed from the french uh, after the, with the coming in of the normans next uh, we can look at say words to do with culture or and cultural artifacts music image prose romance okay tragedy sorry tragedy palace palace paper pen okay so this is another domain in which we find um, a number of borrowings from the french language further we will also talk about fashion okay fashion or social artifacts right social artifacts apparel embroidery emerald sapphire right these are some of the words that uh, come from the word dress for instance okay these are uh, words that are all that belong to uh, the domain of fashion next food there are several food i uh, you know uh, words in the vocabulary that were borrowed from french and these among these are appetite sugar trickle blanche mints gravy etc okay now when we look at you know these borrowings when you look at the number of french words that have been what are other domains that we looked at we looked at culture uh, and intellectual production we looked at food uh, we looked at fashion we looked at dress we looked at law for instance okay and you know you uh, i'm for a person who knows this for the first time and you know, would find or she would find it find it tremendously you know interesting that so many of the words that we call english words appetite trickle or uh, the words in in law for instance church words for instance laws of government okay that is something that i missed out 
and we'll talk about that in a while. Words of government, for instance, all these words are words that were actually not English. These are words that have been borrowed from French following, um, uh, you know, following the Norman conquest, right. So, uh, next if we look at, at grammar, right, the most important points that are to be noted here um, are, is that in English grammar, the changes were mostly general reduction or uh, the general reduction of inflections or endings, right. Um, Let us read from here, in English grammar, the changes were mostly general reduction of inflections, endings of the noun, adjective and to some extent verb okay, of the verb were altered in pronunciation in a way that these almost lost their distinctive form and hence their usefulness. The grammar of the English language was reduced from a high, this is most important, the grammar of the English language following the Norman conquest was reduced from a highly inflected language to an, to an extremely, uh, almost extremely analytical one. When you compare the scripts of Old English and Middle English, this is one of the first things that is going to strike you and as I said go to, you know look it up in Google images, look it up in uh, you know YouTube and you will find that one of the first things that strikes you is uh, in that you know there is a certain leveling, okay? there is a certain leveling out. Uh, and it removes okay, or it uh, uh, does away with the inflectional system. So, as a result of this what happens is uh, uh, prepositions become very important, okay. prepositions become important, word order becomes important and there is a replacement of grammatical gender with natural gender. We looked at uh, you know gender just a while ago. Uh, strong verbs become regularized, right? And um, the strong weak adjective disappears as a result of the loss of inflectional uh, endings. This, uh, uh, you know, a visual, uh, image here shows you how there was the loss of inflections, okay? And here you'll find there was a reduction of these endings, a, u, e, and um, to a uniform e, right? So. Uh, it is perhaps from this, uh, you know, period from Middle English that uh, the the characteristic of English as being member. Um, uh, with, I think we'll be uh, talking about this in one of the lectures. Uh, is the simplicity of the language? Okay, so we may even use a word from agriculture and gardening here, which is pruning. Okay, pruning of the inflectional endings and reducing it to simplicity. Okay? This is one of the most important characteristics of change from Old English to Middle English. Okay? Now, Baugh, A. C. Baugh, uh, whose text, uh, History of the English Language is a seminal text here. It's, it's, um, uh, it was published long ago, but still remains one of the most important words here. Okay? Uh, he says that in early Middle English, only two methods of indicating the plural remained fairly distinctive. Uh, the ending s or es from the strong declension and the en from the weak. By the 12, by 1200 and the early 1250s, the ending s was accepted as the standard plural ending in the North and the Midlands and by the 14th century, it had become the normal sign of the plural in English nouns. Okay? So, the, uh, with uh, the loss of other inflections, finally things were streamlined. For instance, the s ending for plural is one of the most common um, uh, and one of the most important uh, you know, um, replacements of other inflections. Right? Also for instance, here you will see the adjective also uh, you know, uh, getting the, the e uh, e ending uh, from their previous forms. Also with the pronoun, you just skip this here, the verb. Now, Baugh further says that with the disappearance of grammatical gender, the idea of sex became the only factor in determining the gender of English nouns. If you recall 
because of the ending, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in women, in women, because of the because the ending was masculine, it was considered masculine. But now, in you know, with the disappearance of grammatical gender, now comes in the idea of sex as the only factor in determining the gender of English nouns, where woman becomes um, feminine, right? not masculine as it was in old English. So, Bohr says further by making English the language mainly of uneducated people, the Norman conquest made it easier for grammatical changes to go forward unchecked. This is also an important aspect. Now, we uh, talked a while ab uh, ago on the French influence on the vocabulary and we would uh, look here at what Bohr has to say, okay, his comments on French influence on the vocabulary. English presented an inferior culture and this was one of the factors involved for the influence of French words upon the English language. Okay. Why was English considered an inferior culture? Why? Because the culture of royalty, the culture of business and um, uh, eventually the culture of the church began to be dominated by French culture, uh, which led on to the ready acceptance of borrowed words borrowed from the French language. Okay. So, we saw a while ago that English was used by the so called common uh, man, okay, while the French language people were you know um, for reasons of you know social climbing people would learn French and particularly people who were moving from you know the say the lower middle classes to uh, you know to the merchant uh, business class okay who had to sort of uh, uh, you know uh, who had to hobnob so to speak with uh, uh, with people in uh, the court the church and the royalty uh, had to learn the French language right. So, in English as uh, Bohr says represented an inferior culture and this was one of the factors involved for the influence of French words upon the English language. And he says a stream of French words poured into English with a momentum that continued until toward the end of the middle English period right. And he too is making this difference between early middle English and later middle English. Now, a stream of French words <coughs> excuse me poured into English with a momentum that continued until toward the end of the middle English period. In this movement two stages can be observed an earlier and a later with the year 1250 as the approximate di dividing line and we shall see in a while why particularly early 13th century was an important uh, watershed okay, dividing line between um, early modern um, sorry middle English and later or late mid, uh, middle English. <coughs> so, earlier borrowings that is Bohr says prior to 1250 were words like baron, noble, dame, servant, messenger and <coughs> the usually scholars agree that the number is roughly around 900 and later borrowings were borrowings uh, uh, that were governmental and administrative, ecclesiastical, legal, military and familiar words of <coughs> sorry fashion belonging to the realm of fashion, food, art, learning and medicine. This is something we have seen earlier. These, this is important. Why? Because these are markers of class division. Okay? Look at a word like servant, right? As compared to noble or baron, right? Look at the word messenger. Okay, uh, these are words that are indicative of class division. And as I said, it is to Middle English that we have to look. If we really have to look at the beginnings, or at least part of the beginnings of uh, uh, the class system in Britain. So. What are the these governmental and administrative words? This is something that I left out. We talked about ecclesiastical, food, fashion, etc. The government uh, and uh, governmental and administrative words are the word government itself, governor, administer, crown, state, empire, subject, rebel, tax, alliance, prince, princess, duke, minister, noble, manners, 
slave, servant, peasant, etc. So, these are now for a person studying this from a political angle would find this a, a most interesting data. Okay. Again, as I said, the division of the people into slave, servant, peasant, words like manner, and it is said that you know many of uh, so, these were some of the words that were um, uh, borrowed from uh, the French uh, language and you find this really infused into so many different domains. I would like to quickly end by uh, you know talking about the rise of standard English and you know um, this again happened with the loss uh, you know of Normandy, the, the, the loss of Normandy which led to interestingly the re-establishment of English. Okay. In around 1204 or 5, Normandy was lost um, by uh, the uh, you know uh, by the royalty in uh, Britain, and with the loss of Normandy came about subsequently a feeling of nationalism. Okay, events like the loss of holdings, right, which we find uh, happened in uh, you know uh, by the end of the 13th century in England, would lead to the gradual you know uh, loss of prestige of a language right then there are many other uh, you know uh, uh, reasons why finally uh, a person like chaucer geoffrey chaucer uh, could determine the growth the find the growth and establishment of a kind of language of a kind of english which was known as the national language okay um, more about this in uh, Professor Borra's lecture on uh, you know uh, the age of Chaucer, and finally we'll end with the importance of London English. By far, as uh, mentioned by Bohr, by far the most influential factor in the rise of Standard English was the importance as London as the capital of England. London English took as well as gave. It began as a Southern and ended as a Midland dialect. The London Standard had been accepted in most parts of the country in writing in the latter part of the 15th century. So, by the time just before Shakespeare, okay, we already have a language in place right, with uh, a standardized dialect, okay, which enabled the flowering of the uh, English language so to speak um, in the hands of great writers like Shakespeare like Ben Johnson, like Christopher Marlowe for instance. Okay. The background to the flowering of that language is this, you know, the late middle English, the growth of nationalist feeling, okay, uh, the, so, you know, if you may call it the separation of the English nobility from the French nobility uh, around 1200, 1200, 4, 5, okay, and by 1250 really as I said French being almost regarded as a foreign language, a language that was so important now regarded as a foreign language. This is the historical background to the great works and the, the person who is uh, you know mo who figures most prominently here is Geoffrey Chaucer and you are aware of the, the famous Canterbury tales. These are the works uh, you know uh, that finally went on to, to bring back the English language. Okay. However, it was sort of already infused with French vocabulary and however, its earlier inflectional system being diminished a lot. This is the, uh, uh, the new language so to speak or the standardized uh, you know, London standard of language that was established and forms a backdrop to the next age which is uh, modern English. Right? So, we end here today and uh, you know one of the most important things which or will uh, you know important questions which may be posed here is uh, you know um, about the battle of hastings and the coming <coughs> sorry the norman conquest and what happened with the coming of the norman french right uh, what changes happen and the and, our, and you should always mention the importance of the class factor okay that uh, even as far as ling language is concerned they we find new terms being borrowed from the French okay, terms that, that uh, are indicators of class status, class, uh, the terms like noble for instance, like servant, like peasant. Okay. Apart from that, you may want to learn 
up some of the words that uh, came. Uh, so, if you get a, you know came with the Norman conquest for instance, if you guess get a question like the Norman conquest uh, uh, led to the borrowing of several words from French okay, in various domains. So, name those domains and give examples of uh, you know those words. Then you would talk about important domains like government and administrative domain like ecclesiastical domain of the church okay, then uh, of, of the business class right then terms leading to cultural life in general for instance fashion uh, food right uh, terms leading to again as I said class. So, these are some of the domains that you you know you can build up like an inventory and learn up the respective words that fall into these okay, and show how you know all these law was another important thing uh, you know domain that we talked about and show how these words continue to be uh, some of the most important words. Okay, so, how, uh, how do you have words uh, in law without talk without using the word crime for instance, without using the word plaintiff for instance or uh, you know complaint or complainant for instance. Okay, so, that English by now uh, is truly uh, you know uh, uh, language that has that is what linguists call a borrowing language. By now, it was uh, you know uh, it is a language which is borrowed heavily from the French language okay. and the middle English period now remember we are talking at, a, at an elementary level the middle English period is largely the tale or story of two things. Okay. One is the Norman conquest okay, and the importance and prestige of French language French culture. Okay. Second part is the diminished prestige of French with the coming in of uh, the spirit of French uh, of sorry English nationalism okay, following the loss of Normandy by uh, the royalty in, uh, in Britain. Okay, uh, with um, I also forgot to mention uh, the black death okay, which were uh, which led to the death of, of many people in Britain and uh, with the labor class the working force becoming important because of the lack of the paucity of labor. Okay. The, and what kind of words were what language uh, you know was used by the working class the language used was English. Okay. So, again now more than the business class you have following the black death the language of the working class being important okay. and finally, the establishment of a standard London dialect finally, to Geoffrey Chaucer and uh, through literature the final establishment and re instantiation of the English language. Okay. So, let us end here in uh, the next language uh, ne uh, next uh, sorry um, lecture we would uh, we shall be talking about early modern English. Thank you.